Welcome back to the Compass Podcast, now the Mining Pod. We sat down again with Mark Grossano of C6 Capital Holdings to talk about energy markets, both international and domestic. We talk about California's crazy ISO, and what's going on with PPAs. Mark, welcome back to the Compass Podcast, now the Mining Pod. Appreciate you coming back. It's been, I think, what, four months since you came on in April? And then in April, we thought markets were pretty wild. I don't know if they got worse or better, but I'm going to leave that to you. You're the expert. (laughs) Well, well, thanks for having me back on. You know, things are wild, and especially depending on if we go international or domestic, we can talk about how crazy they've been or how steady they've started to get, but we can go through the different nuances within each. Yeah, let's do that. I wanted to start off just with some headlines. So we'll we'll probably start with international markets and then go to domestic. And uh, as you said, right before we start talking, both these things feed into each other. So it's probably not a wrong way to have that conversation. But here's some headlines. Bloomberg this morning, European gas slumps as Bloc prepares details for intervention. UK lifts shale gas fracking ban in bid to boost fuel supply. California narrowly averts an electricity crisis amid scorching heat. Can Germany's economy minister keep the lights on this winter? And a bad year for crypto is a really bad one for crypto miners. So we have <laughs> some, some Doomberg headlines. It's some good ones. Just, so, yeah. So doom and gloomer on that one. That was good. That's a good way to for an uplifting Monday. I'm sure everybody's so excited to hear about this one. I mean, it's just a reality of things, right? Like a, a year ago, everyone was just happy as a clam, right? Yep. Um, the September of last year, Bitcoin was going back up. We were marching towards an all-time high, 69k. And you know what? Gotta take the bad along with the good. Yep. And just a notice on these headlines. These are, you know, Bloomberg, New York Times. The Guardian, Wall Street Journal. And I'm not pulling these things off zero hedge. These are just basic headlines that ordinary folk are seeing and they're scratching their heads and be like, I've never had to worry about energy in my life. Like I turn my thermostat on and off just to like make sure I'm not spending too much money, but they don't right. care about this. And now we're just getting hit by it. So I want to pass it off to you. Let's, let's start with some international markets talk and understand like what, what's going on there, uh, unless you have any immediate uh, thoughts or reactions to those wonderful headlines I gave you. You know, I think it's good to start in Europe because that there's a lot of things that are happening between the two. And 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 again, you 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 joke about the zero hedge side, but at the same time, they, it's all about clickbait. So it's just how baity can they make the headlines? So then you have to totally. you click into it and it usually, <laughs> you know, mellows you out just a touch in terms of where things are. But I, I think the the important piece is going to be Europe because when you look at European flow, there's you're going to hear two sides of the debate. You're going to hear those type of headlines, which are the world is ending. And then people that are like, oh, but storage is fine, so we'll survive. And it's somewhere in the middle, just like anything else in the world. You know, it's somewhere where, okay, the storage is in a better position than where it was. They've been very active in terms of trying to ensure that there is enough natural gas in there. There's enough uh, value in terms of the uh, just the ability to generate electricity. But then there's the other side of, what did they have to do to get there? And, and when you look at the two, you have to look at them separately and then we'll put them together. So storage, they've been very aggressive buying in the LNG market, trying to ensure that they have at least 85 to 90% of their storage already there ahead of the what is called the shoulder season, which is your typical fall. You know, you're not, the, the AC is off, the heat's not really on yet. You're kind of in this middle ground. And that's when you normally see the biggest increase in, in uh, volumes. But in order to get to and make the progress that they've done, they had to go into the market. They were, they've been buying up as much LNG as possible, which is why LNG prices, which is for those that don't know, liquid, liquefied natural gas. So it's just natural gas in a liquid form. And that's how you move it around the world because it, it doesn't make economic sense as, uh, when it's compressed. So it's it, it's they've driven up prices. They've pulled a lot of that out of Asia, but they've also uh, caused companies to cut uh, utilization rates. So we've about seventy percent of fertilizer companies have cut uh, between seventy to seventy percent of fertilizer and petrochemical capacity has been cut 
just because it's too expensive, it's too costly, natural gas prices are too high. You've seen refiners that have cut uh, capacity. And then you've we've seen industrial complexes, everything from um, uh, glass blowers all the way down, have just cut runs and cut activity just because it's too costly. So yes, people can look at the at the storage and say, well, storage is fine. It's like, but how much damage did you do to your economy to get there? And you can't you can't maintain that. And we haven't even started pulling stuff out for uh, for winter heating. So I think Mother Nature is going to have a lot to say on how quickly a lot of this uh, natural gas gets pulled out of storage. Yeah, two quick reactions. One, the fertilizer numbers. I did see that. That's thousands of people, right? That's thousands of jobs, and that's mm-hmm. thousands of dollars, millions, billions of dollars going to the economy that are not flowing now because they've had to shut off those those heavy industries in Europe. Uh, I'm curious to see what the repercussions are over the next three to six months from that. And like you said, I think it's going to be pretty, pretty terrible. Yeah. And, and it's a great point that you bring up on, on just the human factor. And then for the company side, just because some of these contracts, their union, there's a certain amount of government, uh, uh, contracts that go along with it. So then the question is, is the company still going to have to pay people that aren't working? And that's why you've actually started to see uh, fertilizer companies that are now importing ammonia just to keep the lights on. Like if they can cover their fixed cost, that's fine. They'll lose on the variable rate, but at least they're going to keep things in operation. And to your point on the knock-on effects, what does next year's harvest look like? You know, we've already seen uh, for you know the most people that are watching this maybe don't follow WASD, but like the WASD came out, which is just looking at how what the agriculture stand is right now. And at corn and soybeans were very low. And, and you're looking at this reverberating through the system. And food is a big concern. I mean, we've seen uh, India cutting their, their rice exports, which is a huge issue for Asia. We've had this is one of the worst wheat harvests uh, in the last, you know, I think this is the, the worst than 2019 and the fourth worst in 20 years. To give you an idea of, and and there's only so much that can be done to offset that. So losing all of this capacity is going to increase the cost of the farmer, which then increases the cost of the consumer, and that's where you continue to see that those inflationary moves. So what you're telling me is don't mess up energy markets because everything <laughs> is just downhill from there. Uh, Follow up question for you: the Head and Shoulders. Maybe explain that a little bit for people who aren't familiar with it. And I'm wondering also between summer and winter where we see most energy being pulled yep. on the grid which one is historically uh, more taxing for the grid where do we use more energy the summer or the winter is it sort of in between sure so it depends on uh, you know we you, you branch in california so california is always going to be on the summer side uh just to give you an idea of of heat waves and and heat waves are are things that most people can can handle based on you know depending on your location but it's really that polar vortex. And, and that's the one that is really crushing when you start to see that breakdown of Arctic air, which brings down these, these massive amounts of cold air. So when you think about you know, what pulls the most, so obviously heat waves are, are a problem. They, they tax the machines, they tax the equipment because of the underlying heat. But I would say that when you're looking at it, it's actually the polar vortex that is worse. And it's the reason why is, Normally, you know, on a normal polar vortex or snow bomb or snowmageddon, all those fun headlines that people like to click on, that's when you could actually see. So, 10 days of cover can come out in three days. And that's just because people are pulling so hard on the system because they're trying to keep their, their heat on. And especially in Europe, and, and, and in, depending on where you are in the US, you may not be prepared for that kind of uh, cooling. Uh, like if you look at Texas, when you had all of those issues during February, you know, most of these homes don't have the insulation we have in, you know, you're in Denver, that they don't have your insulation. They don't have your structure. They don't have, so you constantly have the heat coming on. And a lot of it is electrical heat, not natural gas or anything that may be more efficient. So you're just pulling more and more on the grid and you don't have the electrification, uh, the, um, the winterization of a lot of this equipment. So that just means that things start shutting down. You start trying to roll things out ahead of time. And if you start to see something that extreme again in, uh, in Europe, 
you'll get that pull very hard on the system, which then is going to cause, uh, you know, we, we've already heard from Macron talking about taking demand down 15%. And and then you've talked about Germany rolling out plans for additional um, uh, sanctions, uh, not sanctions, uh, di- additional hurdles or or uh, or you know ceilings in terms of what people can use to try to ensure that you know p- people don't freeze to death in the middle of the winter. For sure, let's stay on the same topic. And I'm just thinking of this from my perspective of just seeing these headlines and being a layman and energy industry it crosses paths with Bitcoin mining, obviously here and there, but there's only so much we need to know. But from your perspective, what are the main concerns for Europe? What are the main energy sources they're trying to pull? You've mentioned liquefied natural gas, you mentioned supply. And then what are some of the decisions political makers are, are, are choosing here? So I saw in the UK, they might put a cap on uh, energy prices. Mm-hmm. I saw the same thing with the EU. Norway is not really sure that they're fans <laughs> of that. Obviously, for a, yep. a, a few self-interested reasons, but yeah, just to, to start off there, what is the largest concerns going to the winter months, and then what are the decisions being made to uh, prevent those from happening? Yeah, so the biggest concerns going into the winter months is what happens if you get a if Mother Nature isn't kind, and if you start to get a cold uh, snap that starts really kind of the beginning of October. And if that ushers in something more extreme, well, you're going to start pulling down fairly quickly. And, and in the past, that wasn't a huge issue because, okay, you know, the winter started a little bit early. We're just going to buy more from Gazprom. You know, that is now gone. You know, now you don't have the ability to just go to Russia and buy more. So you have to rely on the LNG market. But the LNG market is, there is, there is spare capacity. Now, as you start getting towards those peak seasons, you know, you really don't have the same availability on the LNG side. So now you're going to be paying up even more. You're going to be pushing that through. And that's the biggest concern is when does winter really start and how much impact or how much are you going to have to cut or cap some of this industrial output to ensure that people have enough natural gas to keep themselves warm and enough uh, enough uh, natural gas to keep the lights on. So some of the things that people are doing is Putting ahead of time so that people can prepare. Look, we may have to roll out some sort of gating in order to ensure that people have enough natural gas. We've seen Germany, who's talked about extending the life of two out of three of the nuclear facilities to ensure that there's enough. They've been stocking up on thermal coal uh, to make sure that if worse comes to worse, you're turning coal facilities back on. And you know the idea is, well, do you give some sort of leniency on the carbon tax? Because even when ele- electricity prices went through the roof, it still didn't make sense to turn coal back on because to buy the carbon offset uh, still made you essentially red. Like there was no point. And, and I think that's the biggest problem when you start looking at the caps. Because when you start looking at these caps, and I'll just take it back to the 1970s, and we've seen those caps never work. And the reason why is because you're capping only one side of the equation, not both sides. So you're, you're capping the amount I can charge someone, but you're not capping my cost. So unless you're going to do both, I, that just means that I'm still paying the market rate, but I'm only getting awarded something that is well below that. And unless I have a way to pass that through, I'm just going to shutter my, my capacity in my facility because... I, not only can I not make money, I'm I'm going to go bankrupt. So instead of instead of only making or losing money on one side, capped on the other, I'll just do nothing, and then that's going to lead to additional shortages. Where if you let it free float to a certain perspective, that's where you can open up some uh, some opportunity. Where okay, well, I, I have to provide some of this. I have to pass this cost on. Otherwise, you're going to have to give me some sort of backing. In order to offset the losses that I'm going to take, because the the international market is going to be so extreme. Now, one of the benefits, and because we've been doom and gloom to this point, <laughs> Russia's been uh, is Russia can't obviously send or you know uh, against the, you know what they're trying to do. They they're not going to send natural gas to Europe, but they still have the gas. They still have to produce. You know, they can't risk turning this equipment off because if they do, they may not be able to turn it back on. You know, they don't have the German engineers in there, the American engineers in there. They don't have our equipment. So it's easier just to keep it operational. So they're now sending more natural gas through pipelines to China. 
So now that means that China is going to be buying less LNG. So that'll put more of it on the water, but you're increasing miles per ton. And all that means is you have a ship that is going a further distance. So that means that there's going to be more ships in use, which means that the rates are going to be higher, insurance is going to be higher, and it's just going to take longer because where Australia used to sell their LNG to China, now they're going to have to go from Australia to the UK and just think about the distance in terms of what we're talking about. Now, there's also some arbitrage that has opened up. So India is currently in negotiations with Russia to take what's called, uh, from Yamal, Russia. There's an LNG facility that used to sell a lot of their LNG into Western Europe. That has since not, no, isn't going to happen going forward. So India has said, look, we'll buy it and they'll buy it at a discount, but they pull LNG from the US. So now they don't really need US LNG the same way, but Europe does. So what they'll do is they'll take the cargo and then they'll resell it into the European markets. And for anyone out there that is asking how you can do that, you don't have what's called a destination clause. And a destination clause, all that means is if you take it from the Gulf of Mexico, it has to go to India. A destinate, If we don't have one, you can buy it from, from the Houston Ship Channel and immediately sell it into Europe. It doesn't have to go to India first which opens up their opportunity to buy cheaper LNG from Russia at a discount and then sell the more expensive LNG into Europe and collect an arbitrage on both sides. Gotcha. And yeah, that's one thing I've seen in a lot of these articles so far is that there's concerns that going into the winter, there could be hyped up demand from Asia that would lead to higher LNG prices or just higher energy prices in Europe where they're in need of a lot of energy. But from what you're saying, it seems like We don't know yet. Like there could be arbitrage there, but there could also be some swaps on the table where Russia has basically just swapped its buyer to India and to China. And the US is also going to have to swap its seller and buyer and move to European markets. Is that directionally correct? Yes. So, and and that's where its prices will be higher because you're, you're, but they're not going to be that those, the fear mongering ones where you're seeing these huge numbers. Because there's there's an arbitrage. If there's an arbitrage, people are going to look to try to collapse that as much as possible. It'll remain open to a point just because distance and availability of ships. And uh, you know, another thing that Asia is looking to do, I, I think South Korea came out and said it today. I uh, no, no, last week, where excuse me, they're going to enrich their natural gas. So what they're going to do is they're going to take some uh, propane and ethane and inject it into the natural gas stream just to increase BTU value. So when you do that, all that means is that gas that was just enriched burns at a higher uh, a higher uh, heat rating, so you need less of it. So they're also looking at ways to kind of maneuver about just, again, trying to be as nimble as possible, but that costs more. So that's where it's like you just have the floor getting moved higher and higher each time where in the past, you know, you were pretty consistent, you know, 250 to 350 was kind of your range on the Henry Hub side. You know, you had anywhere in 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 uh, Asia, you had an, about $10 LNG. Now you're sitting at $53 LNG. And and that's where you look at these abilities and, and the spreads. And one of the things that I, I said earlier is that you'll see some of that stabilization. It's just going to stabilize at a much higher rate. And uh, and you're just not going to see the prices that we're used to because we got jaded and we kind of squandered the opportunity at this point. And now we're we're in this position that there's no easy fix. You know, even if Russia turned around and said this isn't where I parked my car and officially left Ukraine, there's still sanctions, there's still issues, there's still the economic incentives either to to do something, not to do something. So it's not like it's going to just turn it on a dime and become a, a better friendly place. Yeah. I, we're going to keep with the, the headline idea here, but I saw a great series on Bloomberg about how Putin has squandered the Soviet's energy play uh, just because there's going to be repercussions from what he's done five years from now where supply chains have transitioned to different places. Want to get the political take from this. We're seeing a lot of headlines of politicians in the UK, in the EU, and in the US making moves with their political power 
to change energy markets. Mm. And from what you just described, it sounds like the market's figuring it out, right? People are just swapping buyers and sellers. It's going to be an arbitrage. Prices will generally increase. It seems like the market is definitely moving. And we have these politicians stepping in and trying to fix some things. Want to get your take on it. And there's a lot there. So choose maybe like the best ones to talk about. Sure. Uh, the Liz Trust one is definitely interesting. Trying to put a, a cap on energy, but then all opening up shale again yeah. in the UK. It's a little wild. So one of the things that's interesting is uh, it, it, they're, they're called the Sherwood Roughnecks. And in the 19, late 1930s and early 1940s, if you're bored, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, we sent 75 roughnecks from the U.S. into Britain to drill for oil and gas right before the outset of World War II. And then we continued that. And in Sherwood Forest, there's still camouflaged equipment where we were actively trying to get this oil and gas to help power the war effort from the location because the U-boats, the first thing that they would target is anything and everything that had a tanker on it. Because the, you know that's if you, if you want to cripple anything, take out the diesel, take out the gasoline and the world stops. So one of the things that we know it exists, there's opportunity there, but the, it, it takes time. You know, it, it, yes, the US has, has helped perfect things. We've learned, we can pass on those learnings to our allies, but you know, do you have the right equipment? Do you have the right know-how? Do you understand the rock? Do you have this geology? Do you have the seismic? You know, there's so many things that come into it where it sounds great. And, and I think it's something that is, is moving in the right direction based on what we've perfected, what we've learned, what we well, had to learn the hard way. You know, they get to benefit from that. But to, to, so to increase it, I think is a good thing. But the cap is just not going to be stable. Because like you said, Norway's not happy about it. It's like, well, I'm going to sell it to you, but I can sell it to someone else at a higher price. Like, why would I sell to you? And that's where you start to see these caps and everyone's like, oh, well, they're just going to be good corporate citizens. And it's like, no, there's, there's a certain point of corporate citizenship that will happen. And then the rest will just be, you know, going to the highest bidder. Because if you go to the highest bidder, you do help balance the market because you're taking them out. The next buyer is lower. And, you know, that's how those arbitrage swaps work. But the, the, the biggest component at this point is going to be the nuke, the nuclear side. And we've seen, uh, you know, uh, taking down these nuclear facilities, even though it's like, well, what are you replacing it with? Like, I don't know, like you're taking down nuke, which is base load capacity. It's constantly operational, 97% uh, uh, you know, on point. And you're going to take them down for what? And then you start doing you know, solar, wind, you know, and then some battery that doesn't really operate the same way. And, and again, I'm not saying that it isn't a basket approach because it is like solar and wind can easily work, but you need something behind it to, to back it up because the wind isn't going to always blow. The sun's not going to always shine. So you need some, some nuclear, you need some natural gas, and you have to make sure that you have a lot of that flexibility within the grid system. And, and I think we're starting to get the, the rethinking on, well, do we need nuclear capacity? Should we have this stay on board? And I think that's going to be the bigger, I, I think, sticking point on the geopolitical side and the political side of how should we consider nuclear power? You know, is it green? Is it not? You know, should we have backing? Should we make the red tape easier? You know, it, what, where are small modular reactors? Does it make sense? And, and I think that's going to be the lessons learned from here is we can't rely on Russia. So we can't rely on natural gas. And to your point on squandering this, the answer is, yeah, you know, you had the ability to bring in and, and create relationships with, you know, the US and, and other Western entities that have a know-how, that have a lot of a technological innovation that has been, happened on the gas front, on the crude front, to go in there and bring that out. And let's be fair, bring it out in the right way. You know, there's, there's, the one, there's one way, which is, you know, if you want to pick on China, the Chinese way of, well, let's pollute and worry about it later or do things efficiently at the beginning. And you might think, well, why would you do it efficiently? If, I can, if I'm leaking methane into the atmosphere, I'm losing money. I want to sell that methane. So I want to capture it to make sure I can sell it to the highest bidder. And again, that's where you coming in, you're creating the structure, you're creating these, these, these efficiencies that can then be carried on. But instead, 
now do you have the right equipment? Do you have the uh, the equipment in in inventory? As it breaks down, who's fixing it? Whose equipment are you using? And if the answer is I don't have any more, well, that's just revenue. Not that's no longer going to your economy. Those are jobs that are no longer going to be generated because these facilities are going to be uh, essentially just uh, deserted. My quick take on it and reaction to it, probably from a very Bitcoiner perspective, is a lot of these moves by politicians are not going to move the needle much. Uh, I'm assuming you somewhat agree, but. Yeah, I'd be curious to get your. Oh, I, I agree with you. It, it's just the the politicians, and this is the problem when you start looking at politicians getting in, um, involved in the economy. You know, you push on one string. There's a million strings that get slack and t- and taut, and they don't. They just think they're pushing on one without thinking about the ramifications and how it reverberates through the system. Where if you're looking at it from you know as the economy as a living, breathing thing, and you have these real time adjustments, when you have these artificial, uh, you know, uh, your hurdles that you have to go through, it just increases cost. It, it increases time it takes to get around them or to figure them out. Especially like as you talked about with, well, we're going to increase shale, but we're going to cap it. It's like, but but. What, wait, what, what, how, wait, so what's my cost? Like, am I going to make money? How do I make money? And so if people, uh, let's be fair, if people can't figure it out, they just won't do it because it's like, well, am, am I going to lose money? Am I going to make money? How, like, how do I pitch it to a bank? You know, how do I pitch it to a, a private equity fund or some sort of private deal? And it makes it difficult. So, I mean, think about, you know, we'll, we'll talk about PPAs. You know, if I'm a Bitcoin miner and it's like, what's my biggest cost? And if I tell you, oh, we'll, we'll figure it out later, it's like, no, I, we can't figure it out later because I need to buy my tech. I have to buy my equipment, figure out what that cost is. I have to figure out my cost of of actually, you know, mining it, and then I have to figure out, you know, within a certain delta, what what my what my price is going to be. Where am I going to sell it? And if I can't figure out my biggest cost, I just won't do it. And I think uh, another point to this whole saga or story we're seeing unfold in front of us month after month is the fact that. Why would these oil guys and why are these energy uh, producers have any trust in the politicians in the first place? And they're trying to kill all these industries a year ago, and now they're coming back and saying, "Like, oh, maybe now you can turn on." Uh, but yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll do as we'll tolerate you as long as we have to. Right. Uh, that's what it seems to me. Let's turn to domestic markets mm-hmm. as well, which I think a lot of listeners in this show are more curious about. Obviously, both feed into each other. Uh, but could you give us the lay of the land for the U.S. domestic energy market? Uh, where are the pain points? Where are we seeing things maybe get better? Maybe we can even like turn a positive note for this conversation. <laughs> well, so the benefit for the U.S. is we have a lot of natural gas here. And, and when you start looking at and I always like to look at cadences and and terminology that politicians throw out. And if you go back to the election, uh, the 2020 election, they used to say the bridge fuel natural gas. And that term bridge fuel is now gone. And I think they're starting to come to terms with the fact that natural gas, propane, butane have a place. And, and they always will. I, you know, I've said from the beginning when we were the last time we spoke, it's like natural gas is always going to have a seat at the table, just given its density, its availability, its ease of use. And I think that's going to continue, but that's a benefit for us. So we have the ability to ramp up and ramp down natural gas production within reason. And the and I say within reason is because you still need the pipelines to get it from point A to point B, back to your point on California, where you still need the ability to get the natural gas to where it needs to be, the ability to now turn that into electricity, and then the wire line to get it to the place that needs it the most. And, and I think that's where we have to see some of that next line of spending is wh- how, where's the power generation and is there enough pipelines to get it from point A to point B? And the short answer is right now, yes. Um, as demand grows, the answer is going to be no. And that's where I think you're starting to get this understanding that we're going to have to continue to build natural gas pipelines to meet those growing demands. And, and just like anything else, there's an arbitrage. We also have two new LNG facilities coming online. You have Golden Pass that's being built. You have Port Arthur that's being built. And then for those that remember when Freeport had their accident, Freeport comes back online uh, starting in November. So you're going to have additional natural gas getting sent into the international market. 
but you also have adoption that's increased in the US. So we need to see that increase in production in order to see our prices kind of stabilize. And, and I don't think they're going to stabilize at 250, 350. It's now closer to five to seven, which would still undercut the world. If you think about just pricing in general, we'll still be one of the lowest cost areas, but you're just going to see that ratchet to the next level as people continue to try to come up with some sort of solution away from you know coal and away from other things while we kind of figure out that that power density side on the battery front. Gotcha. So it's going to specific ISOs and then even move into like on the developer level of PPAs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Curious about California. I read that headline earlier. I think most people who listen to the show would probably know about this story, but I'll summarize it again for anyone who missed it. California suffered near blackouts. I think they had some brownouts and maybe some like strategic blackouts in some very small areas. It was last week based on a huge heat wave. I think temperatures reached as high as like 116 in Sacramento, mm-hmm. uh, San Francisco, which is just, you know, well known for its lovely weather, uh, <laughs> had, had temperatures up into the hundreds. Uh, it was pretty brutal. Luckily, things have cooled down after some tropical storms rolled in, but it put the energy grid to the test with the demand they have not really experienced beforehand. And uh, the Bloomberg story out of this was California saves its energy grid by proactively working with buyers of the grid, i.e. retail people turning off their lights and turning off their AC systems. And they were able to turn off demand just in time to stop an actual blackout from happening. So a lot of people ran this out as like a big, great headline that California saved itself just by everyone working together, uh, which is very on brand for California. Shout out to my California listeners, but it's very on brand for California. I'm curious to get your take though, as an energy expert, was this a successful... I know, like, uh, this is a pretty historic event to have this much heat hitting California right. at the same time. So, was this really like a, a success for the grid, or is this really a disaster in showing something that is looming in the future for that grid if they don't update their infrastructure? I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I, and I would go with th- this is something that's looming where, you know, you averted disaster once, but we've already seen the extremes. You know, we've seen the extremes in 2020. I was talking about, 800 year floods in China. And now in year 2022, I'm talking about record droughts in the same area. And that's separated by two years. So you're seeing the extremes increasing. And the problem is, as if you remember at at the same time, they're also, they want to ban the sale of gasoline cars by, I think it's 2035. So it's like, all right, so you're going to take away the gasoline cars, which means you're going to replace it with EVs which means you're going to increase demand over that same time period. And you're already on the cusp of a bigger issue going forward. By the, you know, natural gas is consumed in there. So at what point are you just going to address the fact that you need something that is more longer term in, ter- in, in moves of that transition? I'm not saying that this transit shouldn't happen. I personally think that hybrids are probably a better, you know, I think compromise in terms of not only battery size, but also the availability and just cost effectiveness of it. But when you're starting to look at how precarious things are, and yeah, 116 is hot, but could it be 118 next year? You know, could it be 118 two years from now? You know, where is hydro? Like they're, they've had a, a continuous drought for 12 years. So you don't have hydropower that you once did, which means that you're, you're losing that power generation you know, they don't want to build wire lines coming from coal facilities in Nevada. So where, how are you going to solve this? Are, are people just going to get used to the fact that, oh, you know, it's 110 degrees out, time to go home and shut everything down? And, and Or do we come up with some sort of solution? And, and I think that there's somewhere in the middle. And, and, you know, some individuals out there will say, well, EVs are meant to also charge the grid when things like this happen. But it's like, but we're seeing the length of time extend and getting more and more pronounced. And that becomes a much bigger issue when you start thinking about, well, how do you weather something that used to be once every 10 years and lasting a day, now once every three years, lasting 10 days? You know, that's a huge shift in terms of the pressure on the grid and what that entails. So there has to be a way to fortify it and to make it uh, essentially redundant 
And I think that's where you do have more solar. You do have the, 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 uh, the sun exposure. You can build them on, on buildings, but they're not always going to work. And they're not always, okay, well, what happens if, they're, if things are too hot and things are getting too aggressive? You need to have that, that natural gas backdrop to help kind of fill the void when you start to see those peaks. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. The the one that's been coming to mind, the comparison here is Texas and California. And I don't know how informative an opinion this is. So do feel free to correct me, but both have large investments in renewable energy. But to my understanding, California has put a lot of emphasis into battery technology. Mm-hmm. And then Texas has put a lot of time and energy into developing ERCOT's demand response program. Right. So you have you know, similar base loads so categorically both using renewables but different technologies that you're leaning on in times of high demand or low demand absolutely and then the question is if you if you start rolling out those batteries at greater levels you know how much lithium copper or cobalt are you utilizing so you want me to use EVs but you're consuming more of the raw materials into industrial size batteries, which is going to absorb some of the spare capacity, but we're not mining additional capacity in Chile and Africa. So at some point, we have to have a real conversation of what do we want our supply chain to look like? How much are we willing to invest in nickel and all the other raw materials that go into it? And again, there's some balance. You know, going, you look at, you 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 brought up Texas, which is a great point. You know, you have all of this installed wind turbines, but none of them are winterized. So it's like, well, shouldn't you winterize some of them? Like, shouldn't some of them be? I mean, there's there's ones in Calgary that in in ten below are still spinning. You know, I, I, again, you need wind, obviously. But if there's wind blowing, there shouldn't be ice sheets. You know, what? How can how can we meet in the middle? And that's where I, I think we have to have that conversation of look, everyone's wrong. Let's just come to the conclusion. Everybody is wrong and come up with the right solution. You know, it's not all green. It's not all oil and gas. It's some balance in the middle. At the very least, it's nice that infrastructural talks like this are sexy again, right? For the longest <laughs> time, no one ever wanted to talk about win, uh, winterizing wind turbines. So I'm, I'm well, glad and it, it, it's out. funny because people don't care <laughs> unless we, I can't turn up, I can't watch Netflix. Are you telling me I'm going to miss yeah. the new Game of Thrones because I can't turn on my TV? Whoa, Matt, let's have a conversation about this. And that's, but that's a good point. Like I had friends uh, that uh, I unfortunately wasn't able to make it to a baseball trip, but uh, you talked about San Francisco. They had a 45 minute delay because of a brownout. Like the lights went off in the stadium because they for, they didn't have enough battery storage, uh, you know, there to keep. So for 45 minutes, they had to wait to get the approval for the interconnect to bring the lights back on. And it's like I that's and again, they 45 minutes. It's a, it's a sports arena. Like you know, who cares? But you can't do that with industrial capacity. You can't wait and be like, oh, sorry, guys, I got to shut everything down. You know, for anyone who works in the industrial sector, you have to prime. You know, you, have, you need you know, the machines to be warm. You know, you have to have make sure that there's hydraulic fluid in certain areas. So it's not like you just flip a switch on and off and things and things operate like there's there's a process behind it. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I, I think like keeping the eye on target here is that everyone wants these grids to work correctly, or at least I hope they do if they're working in the energy sector. I hope that they have a, a goal of providing more energy for more people at better rates with right. cheaper and better energy sources. Let's move to the last topic while I have you, and that's on purchase price agreements uh, or power purchase agreements. Mm-hmm. We've seen a lot of Bitcoin miners squeezed by PPAs recently, including Compass. And just for backstory, if anyone's listening, isn't familiar with Compass. We have two hosting facilities that we partner with in Georgia. Uh, we just hosted with them. We don't have a PPA with them because hosting contracts don't typically work like that. But the owner of the facility had uh, did not have a PPA and we're using a variable rate. And so they got squeezed and a lot of people in these facilities had to move out. And that's a pretty common story, just, just using as a touchstone here since this is the Compass podcast. Uh, makes sense to sort of tell our, our story here. I've heard of a lot of other people doing this. Northern Data, big Bitcoin miner in Europe is starting to turn down energy purchases from the grid because Bitcoin mining revenues are low. Energy is getting really expensive. All these variable rates people have signed for PPAs 
are starting to bite them in the ass a little bit. I'm curious to get your take on PPAs, uh, maybe just like a little background on how these are written and formed, just for the audience. Sure. And, and get your reaction to this. I'm assuming you're not really caught off guard, but I think a lot of Bitcoin miners who went to these facilities are caught a little flat footed. You know, we have uh, we have a deal with a Bitcoin miner up in uh, New England and we offered fixed. So there's two different ways to do it. You have the variable rate where you're just taking whatever the rate I, I can get or uh, there's a fixed rate. And the fixed rate can be a fixed rate for a set period of time or a fixed rate that will will fluctuate based on a six month average, a or you know as you go forward, or there's like a step up of five, seven, ten percent every year just to keep up with maintenance cost. So one of the things that we did is we we signed a a fixed PPA where, but it, it can be terminated and rewritten in thirty days. So it's something. The idea was that we'll give you a discount. But we have the ability to come back as a, someone who's a power producer. We have the ability to come back and say, "Hey, prices went up. You know, we'll, we're willing to work with you. You know, what would you like? You know, this is what we think we can do." Because there's always going to be a lot of variability, and it it was it was about two and a half pennies above the going rate. So they were comfortable because they could plan their market and two and a half cents long term, you know, we're not going to get there right away. So it's something where everybody is comfortable in the structure that we have. Now, when you start looking at doing your own PPA, the the push is always for fixed, you know, getting as close to fixed as possible. And if they push back on that, offer up the ability to increase every three months or six months, some discount below the uh, the going rate. And you can sweeten the pot with, look, I'm paying you rent. I'm on your facility. I'm paying you a rent piece, so that's that's some a credit to me. I'm giving you some sort of flexibility so that you have some comfort to uh, to release. And then if if there is some opportunity behind that, is also to have some sort of rev share, whether that be one, three, five percent of whatever revenue is, just to make sure that you're going to get that other little bump. Another thing that I'm seeing, and again, it depends on the technology you have installed is the ability to almost flex between a data center and a Bitcoin miner or some crypto miner in general. And I think that that is going to become a very interesting opportunity because even if Bitcoin prices go down or crypto prices go down, you can still pivot over to have some sort of data processing. And I think that's actually becoming a very interesting time because realistically, there's not enough molecules being made. And I think that's the biggest problem. And that could be said about diesel, about electricity, about uh, about data, if you want to think about bandwidth in general. And I think that there's some, some balance between the two to try to create that. Now, the PPA is going to be done uh, in terms of different pieces. Uh, the PPA could be off of a MISO. It could be off of the local, depending on it, you know how it's being produced. So since we're producing our own power, we can do things that are what's called behind the meter. And I think that's where you want to try to get the closest to is behind the meter. Because if you're in front of the meter, you someone has to pay for marketing and distribution, for maintenance. So if you can get on site and co-locate with someone, that's also going to give a certain benefit because you won't have the same hit from the distribution side that could uh, hinder your underlying economics. Gotcha. Curious to get one final take from you. Sure. Where do you see domestic energy prices going over the next three to six months? Oh, obviously, we're in the shoulder period. So I'm expecting it's going to go you know, maintain for a yeah. little bit and then into the winter go up. So it might be a pretty easy prediction for you there. But I'm curious to see because we've seen hosting rates and energy rates go up You know, between 20 and 40% isn't uncommon in Bitcoin mm-hmm. mining right now. I think there was uh, a panic and I think a lot of people were caught flat footed. So there was a certain mark to market that happened. And, and I don't think you're going to get that next step up because I, I think people have an idea of what the market is doing. I think some have already started hedging to look at, okay, well, prices are cheaper now for this, for the winter months. I'm going to go out through the, into the curve. I'm going to hedge a bit, make sure that I have that power backlog. But when you look at, you know, you talked about the different ISOs. Each ISO is going to be slightly different because each one is going to have the swing produ- uh, production. 
So if you, you look at New England, New England relies on LNG as their swing. The Midwest relies on thermal coal coming from the Illinois Basin, the Powder River Basin. And then Texas in that south is going gonna, is gonna to really be kind of tied to Henry Hub. So realistically, you if you're a Bitcoin miner or a crypto miner, you want to target the Midwest and the South. Uh, the Midwest it, prices will go up, but you know, like if you look at places in in New England, you could be at 22 cents a kilowatt hour. Where if things get really bad in the Midwest, maybe you're at nine cents. You know, if you're in the South, depending on how you are, how you're configured, you you could be anywhere between you know five and seven cents, depending on the deals that you structured. So for me, it's always going to be getting behind the meter and getting in those two locations. I, I this is selfishly because we're looking to buy assets in in the uh, in the Midwest. You, you don't have weather as the same issue. You know, I think Bitcoin miners and, and crypto miners were were <laughs> learned the hard way what what a Texas desert can do to you in uh, <laughs> in in peak heat months, where yeah. you know you don't have that that kind of variability, and because we're we're hydroelectric, you know, there's already water on site that can that can be used for cooling. So those are the, the I think the key pieces, but always do fix you know variable within within a window. So you're taking the average. So if say for an example, August is terrible. August prices are a twelve cents, but July was seven, June was six. Always do an average because the average uh, over the length of your contract, the average will work in your favor when you're the buyer, the seller won't catch the peak they won't ca- they won't also they'll also miss the bottom so both can win and and i always joke that a good negotiation is everybody's very unhappy and i think that makes everybody unhappy and that's the perfect place to be when you're writing these kind of deals i love that advice to end the show mark thank you so much for joining the compass podcast it was great to see you again that's uh, a pleasure thanks for having me on <laughs>